G'day guys, welcome back to Chalk Talks, where I talk blacksmithing, bladesmithing, metallurgy, and more. Today, we're talking about handle construction. Now, anyone who's got into knife making knows that there are a myriad of ways to put together a knife handle. And so many of us end up sticking with just one that we really prefer. But what I'm going to discuss today is all of the different choices that you have and what they have offer you in terms of usability and aesthetics and stuff like that that could potentially help your next build. First construction that I'm going to talk about is one that we're probably all familiar with, and that's the full tang. The full tang means that it is the full width of the handle material, which means it's visible from top, bottom, and behind. It, there is no place in which the tang is concealed other than on the scale sides. Now, the advantage to this is that obviously it provides the largest amount of material at the neck of the knife, the shoulders of the tang. Because it is full width, you have full thickness of material there, which provides strength. But there are some downsides to having a full tang. One, for instance, is if you're using carbon steels, then hands are going to be in contact with this tang piece. And while the owner may oil the blade, they may not oil the tang sides which means that you'll end up with rust and pitting happening along the tang. And if you haven't got a proper glue joint or a proper seal between your uh, scale material and your tang, moisture from the hands can then seep down into between those two and rust the tang from the inside, which is really, really bad for a knife. Now, a lot of us, when we begin bladesmithing, prefer this method because it requires no uh, really nasty guard fitting and all that kind of stuff. You can literally just slap a couple of pieces of wood on the sides and put some pins in. You can, however, bring this to the next level by adding something like a front bolster. If you add a front bolster, there is obviously a whole myriad of ways you can attach bolsters, but you can then, if that adds a little bit of stylistic advantage to the build. You could also add a rear bolster which is quite common in pieces that involve stuff like Mother of Pearl or Mammoth Walrus Ivory and all that kind of stuff. Um, the reason being is that the top and bottom bolsters then protect the edges of the scale material and mean you need to have less material to make a scale out of. Some notes I will say about full tangs, even if you're not using bolsters, is your pin position. Pin position is incredibly important on all knives, but especially on full tangs. And I see it done wrong a lot of time because uh, we, you know, there are some simple rules that you need to follow that don't always get followed. They don't have to be equidistant from each other, but what they do have to be is these two have to be equidistant from the ends. So if this one is an inch in and that one is an inch in, this one will go in the middle of those two, which is normally above if you have a finger notch or a finger choil, normally that will go straight above that. All three of these should be one millimeter closer to the spine than they are to the belly. Now, the reason for that is because if you put a pin dead center, it will always look low on the design. So it will always look heavy on the design and a little bit off center, low. If you put it high, it will always look dead center. I don't know why. It's a trick of the eye, but uh, I got taught this by a master smith and it has always held me true. So when I'm measuring my pinholes, I always measure the, uh, the distance between top and bottom and then aim for a millimeter higher than center. Normally that means that I'm just basically uh, putting the pin on the edge of the hole I would have drilled otherwise. The other thing of course, is if you're going to do full width pins, you should be peening them. Even if you're using a really strong epoxy, I highly recommend peening your pins or using Corby fasteners or loveless bolts or something like that because these provide a mechanical connection as much as the glue holding them at will as well. Let's all move on to the next one. The next most common construction is what I like to refer to as the stick tangs. Now, stick tang can refer to anything from your average mall katana, you know, rat tail tang, which is just basically a threaded rod attached to the end of your blade, all the way up to a full through tang. Um, they're all kind of in the same area. But if we have the 
subsections of stick tang. We have hidden, through, and this one would technically be the true stick. Now, hidden tangs are, as the name describes, completely concealed by your handle material. Right? And the handle material is normally one solid com composition. Not always, and we'll get to that in a minute. But <laughs> normally you're going to have a solid composition of handle construction so that you can have full 360 access to nothing but the handle material, whether that be a synthetic or a wood or anything like that. I find these more comfortable and they're quite common in countries like, um, you know, Scandinavia, you know, most of Scandinavian countries, uh, Japan, China, and stuff like that, especially in the early medieval period because it required less material to make and also meant that you did not come into contact with blade steel, which meant that you had less likelihood of causing corrosion. I also just find them more comfortable <laughs> in general. Through tangs are also an incredibly common option. Some you'll see would have a pin and a peen, but in order to have a peen, normally they require, maybe not a front, but definitely a rear bolster. And that bolster is there to stop the pin from splitting the wood open or splitting the handle material open. This is a very common construction type for things like Viking saxes and that kind of thing. I really like this uh, approach when making uh, deer handled knives, like horn handled knives and stuff like that. I find this one to be one of the most attractive ways to do it because you really can get those bolsters to follow the, uh, the craggy outline of your deer antler. You can get some really nice shape on your uh, on your pommels, which means that you get a really nice kind of naturalistic look whilst also having the metal involved. And on larger knives, that rear pommel provides a counterweight. And again, you have full 360 access to the handle material, which means it's much more comfortable and you don't come into contact with the carbon steel. I would steer away from welding threaded rod <laughs> at your tang shoulder. Most of the time the katanas have like a little stub and then this stick, I would avoid this construction method. Welding a rod onto a hidden tang to turn it into a through tang, where you actually have a threaded rod welded on and a pommel nut, much like Kyle Royer would use, is a perfectly valid way of doing this, but you want this area to be secure. Now, with stick tangs, one of the things I see commonly used is guards and bolsters always being used on these. Now, historically speaking, guards and bolsters were not common on everyday uh, hidden tang knives. They were only used on the more expensive stuff. So if you're starting out with hidden tangs and you're perhaps a little frightened of making bolsters and guards, which they can be a massive pain to make, try making one without it and try getting your fit to the wood to be quite accurate and, you know, go from there. Because once you've achieved that, then you'll be able to move on to the next stage. And I highly suggest working in non-ferrous metals or, uh, you know, G10 or something like that to make your first bolsters because it's much easier to remove the material than it is on steel. A lot of people start with mild steel or high carbon steel, heavens forbid. Um, but yeah, no, start with non-ferrous metals, brass, copper, that kind of thing um, in order to make your first bolsters and then move from there. Obviously, this opens the door to a million different options. <laughs> Now, you've got the options of different guard materials, different pommel materials. Um, the constructions will vary based on historical aspects, perhaps. But even in a modern context, the through tang provides the security of the pin holding the handle together, which basically negates the need for epoxy, although epoxy is useful in uh, you know, cementing the handle onto the tang and not having it come rattling loose. But you also have the advantage of the ability to use large blocks of wood that have beautiful grain and all that kind of thing that you can see in a 360 degree pattern without having glue seams and stuff like that. That being said, there are other ways to construct around stick tanks, and I'm going to move into that now. You'll have to excuse my terrible drawing, but 
Uh, these are a couple of the different methods that I have personally used and have seen used uh, in making handles for hidden tang and through tang knives. Now, the first one is quite obvious. If you don't have a block or if you don't have the ability to drill a hole in the block that's capable of accepting the tang, you can take a piece of, you know, just a board of wood, chisel your tang slot into it, and then glue another piece on. Now, of course, this leaves a glue seam between the two, uh, but is very traditional, especially in Japanese cultures in which you'd actually cut the tang slot out of both sides, having one side be slightly deeper than the other so that the uh, edge of the blade is actually hitting the, uh, the wood and the same in the tang. But um, this is an incredibly traditional one for swords as well, especially uh, European style swords that were then wrapped in leather because it didn't really matter that they were two pieces because the leather wrap held them together, the glue on the leather as well. But I've used this for many constructions. I actually have this in construction on my uh, cutlass and it doesn't have all the wrapping on it. It's just that and some epoxy and it holds together just fine. And you can use that for um, both full tang and hidden tang, uh, through tang and hidden tang knives. Um, it doesn't have to be a hidden tang knife, but it is quite commonly used on that. Here we have a representative of a frame tang. Now, Frame handled knives are quite popular these days, especially popularized by people like uh, Jerry Fisk and Kyle Royer and those guys, because it provides you the ability to basically use any material that you would use in a full tang on a hidden tang. So the hidden tang, it can be a half hidden tang like this with a pin through it, or quite commonly the, uh, the tang slot will actually continue through to here and have a pommel nut on a screw there. I've done a hidden, um, through, uh, I've done a hidden, hidden tang like this, uh, where actually the bolt was secured in a hole inside the tang and the threaded rod or the thread on the tang was actually screwed into inside the handle and then it was all sandwiched together. And that was in the build for my Muso boo that I did for 2019's um, or 2020's uh, Blade, Perth Blade Show. So if you're interested in seeing that, I've got a video on my channel. I'll link it up here if I remember. But that being said, this construction is normally quite secure because you've normally got that threaded connection. You can have force on the guard material or the bolster material, ferrule material, whatever you have, that has a uh, <laughs> force on the blade so it's not going to come apart even without glue. And that's why a lot of people like Kyle use it for takedowns. The other advantage, as I said before, is that you can use handle material that you would otherwise use on a hidden tank, on a full tank knife. The thing is, is that blocks of, uh, for instance, mother of pearl don't, don't happen. They don't th naturally occur in block form. And so if you wanted to make a mother of pearl handled Bowie knife or a mother of pearl handled hunting knife or something like that, you need to use a full tang. And sometimes if you're using a full tang, you can't uh, apply something like a double quillion S guard, something like that because on a full tang, you wouldn't be able to get it over the butt of the tang, especially because normally it flares to the butt and narrows towards the ricasso or the, the joint between the blade and the handle. And so having a hidden tang allows you to use guards and ferrules and stuff like that, but then the frame allows you to have uh, flat slabs instead of blocks to use for your handle. This can also be used with just wood and traditionally in uh, Japan, they've done this, where they will literally just take a piece of wood that is the same shape or the same thickness as the tang and cut the tang slot out of it and then sandwich uh, it with normal pieces of wood, especially for kitchen knives and stuff like that. If you're using it for something a little hard, harder wearing, I suggest putting a pin through there and a pin through in multiple places in the frame. When making frame tang knives, it is incredibly important that you make sure you have enough room in the frame to drill and peen your pins without the material that is going on as scales fracturing. And it's quite common. I made the mistake in my 48 hour dagger build where I actually put the pins a little bit too close to the edge and actually managed to chip out one of the pieces of handle material that I was using. So if you're gonna do this style of construction, make sure you leave enough meat in the frame to actually drill through and leave yourself some meat on the scales. Now, the final construction is one that's pretty much only used for kitchen knives, but it's quite commonly used there, especially in Japanese, again, cutlery. 
uh, and that is the dowel method. Now, I don't see why you couldn't use it on a European-style hunting knife, or even a Bowie knife or something like that. You'd need quite a large dowel, obviously, because the width of the dowel, uh, the diameter of the dowel, is the width of your tang. Not the thickness, but the width. And basically all you do is you cut a kerf, the thickness of your tang, down a dowel, normally three quarters of the way or so, so might, or you can cut the whole thing in half and just sand them down until they're thin enough. And then you drill a hole, the width of your dowel, the diameter of your dowel, into the handle, however deep you want for your tang. And then basically you just slip the tang in with the dowel pieces, glue, or glue and all, and that holds the thing in place and keeps it nice and centered. And obviously, um, if you had a bolster material in front of that, you wouldn't be able to see the join. Uh, the ones that I've made, I made a Japanese-style kitchen knife a while back. I actually just left the dowel showing, because I liked showing the construction and how it was made. But uh, yeah, this one's quite popular with people who are making kitchen knives and stuff like that, because it's really simple, and it's very effective. So if you're kind of scared of hidden tangs, uh, like I said before... Um, <laughs> A lot of us haven't tried it purely because we were scared of doing them because they are a massive pain. Uh, this is actually a really good way to start. So uh, yeah, give it a try and let me know how you go. Now one of the last things I'm going to do, touch on is weird kind of semi-amorphous tangs. <laughs> Called half tangs. So these aren't as common, especially these days, as they used to be. Back in the early 19th century and all the way through up until the early 20th century, this kind of half tang, where the tang only extends about a quarter of a way to a third of the way down the handle, was quite common, especially in the Americas and in France and England, uh, especially in cutlery, like uh, you know kitchen knives and that kind of thing. There are various theories why they were full width of the handle, but they were obviously not full length. Some people believe that it may have been to do with uh, metal availability, simply cutting down on the use of metal. Uh, others may have, you know, considered it the early start of the hidden tang, but hidden tangs were already in existence at the time. It's really hard to tell why, but it is a very historic con uh, construction. Unless you're recreating a historical piece, I wouldn't use this technique, uh, purely because it is the least secure method of <laughs> hanging your uh, blade on a tang on a handle, and also it puts a lot of strain on that joint. Because you're slitting down the center of whatever material you're using, it provides a weak point at the base of the tang, and it almost always ends to a, a hole behind the tang, which then has to be filled with epoxy or something other kind of like, so, something like that, in order to avoid moisture getting trapped behind the tang. So not advisable. The second one is one that I've seen only in uh, injection molded blades and in blades using uh, things like micarta. And I actually have a blade, a uh, custom made blade that has this construction. And that is a top half tang. And <laughs> I didn't even know it was a thing until I received the knife that I was given. And I may put a photo up of it if I remember. Um, but basically it was molded, form molded from the tang. If this is the the rear of the blade, you can see the top has the tang material in it and it runs the full length of the blade all the way in to the knife. And I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the transition actually looks more like that in, inside the handle. Now, this is a strange uh, way of doing tangs it's incredibly comfortable because you have uh, nothing but the handle material in contact with your hand here, uh, but it's also quite strong because obviously you don't have any sharp transitions to the blade. I, again, I am not entirely certain why this specific build style was used, and um, I haven't attempted it myself <laughs> uh, because getting a proper fit up to your tang from any other handle material other than something you could mold around the tang it's very difficult, so uh, I'm not sure I would suggest this tang method, but I thought I'd add it here. But Sam, I hear you cry. Aren't integrals a different form of construction? Uh, no. <laughs> Basically. So, the, the main key difference between integrals and any other form of handle construction is purely the fact that the bolsters or guards are 
forged from the piece or ground from the piece that the you know final knife is ground from. It doesn't actually change how the handle is attached, right? Because obviously you can have a full tang, you could have a hidden tang uh, integral. Again, you could have a, an integral with a through tang like this. Um, all of the constructions we've already discussed can be used integrally. It's the only difference is, of course, that you're fitting up to an integral bolster rather than fitting a bolster of your own. So in terms of integrals, you're not really talking about a new construction. You're just talking about jumping the queue of having to cut, uh, you know, guard slots and stuff like that. But of course, then you have to deal with actually trying to forge integrals, which isn't as easy as it looks. So um, <laughs> if you're interested in learning how to forge blades, I have an entire playlist about that, which I will link up here. But yeah, basically you can approach the fit up of these exactly the same as you would approach any other fit up on any other knife. Thank you for watching guys. I really appreciate it. And if you like this series, make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell icon to be notified when I upload new videos, because this is part of a series and it's got many, many, many episodes to come. <laughs> if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to my patrons who I'm going to display here. These guys are the ones that keep this channel running, that keep me engaged with the content and obviously feed me ideas that I can then put into uh, Chalk Talks and How to Forges and stuff like that. They also put gas in the tank and a hammer in my hand every day and I couldn't be here without them. So thank you guys so much. And if you want to join the Patreon crew and get access to behind the scenes videos and access to my videos before they get uploaded, then just hit the link down in the description below or in the tag at the end of this video and you can come join the family. But with that being said, I hope you have a fantastic week. Get out there and make some stuff, have some fun. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And if you do, make sure you film it and I'll see you next time. Bye guys.